वेलकम टू क्रिएट ट्वेंटी दी को हॉट ऑफ ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री क्रिएट ट्वेंटी इज दी मोस्ट एनुअल फ्लैगशिप प्रोग्राम वेरी सेलिब्रेट एक्सेप्शनल ट्वेंटी क्रियर इंडियंस एवरी ईयर टूडे वी हैव न्यू विद अस न्यू इज अ ट्रांस डिसेबल नॉन बाइनरी पर्सन एंड द फाउंडर ऑफ यू एंड रिकोगनाइज रिवाइवल डिसेबिलिटी इंडिया दे वर्क रिवॉल्व अराउंड वर्किंग विद टेक्नोलॉजी एंड क्रिएटिंग सेफर डिजिटल स्पेसिस for queer and disabled folks online a disability justice author and curator they have collaborated on several spaces that reclaim disabled joy rage rest and movement they have won the largely award 2022 for their writing on disability based queer violence and are a published author with penguin random house currently they are working on a solo book now without further ado Let's talk to you. You thank you so much for joining us today. So, when I started activism, I always see that you know, in a way, I limped into disability activism and no disability justice. Um, because uh, earlier when I was in, when I was in, um, I started activism in twenty twenty. Right when I just graduated, um, well, as an undergraduate, um, when I was an undergraduate, or when I was in school, I never had the language of empowerment. I never had the language of how to um describe my disabled body, how to love my disabled body, and how to care for it when I lose my disabled body. I never had the language. growing up um uh, and i feel like when i found an environment disability in india it wasn't an isolation i i found it but i wasn't the only one that took it forward it's very much a community made initiative um i call myself community made instead of self made um because i feel like when i met um when i met other queer disabled folks right in online spaces in conferences in meetings they provided me the language with which i was able to assert it and yes i am disabled yes i will take power in my identity but at the same time i will hold space for those moments where um i grieve my able body in life i grieve what could have been because that is as important as loving your disability right you know you see both sides of it grief is a very important part um uh, I could describe myself as someone who's um who's also non-binary and who identifies as a trans non-binary physically disabled individual. Um, my location, right? Because disability is not a blanket term. Um, I'm not only a disabled person. We 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 come with a The story of identity, identity, right? Um, I'm a physically disabled, trans, non-binary, upper caste person. Um, and in that way, uh, when we um when we describe disability, we describe it in terms of class, class, gender, um. Sexuality, queerness, or uh, disability is not a unidimensional term. Um. So. So what I'm trying to say is, I have grown up in a world that wasn't designed for my ability or my sexuality. Queerness and disability, ah, uh, they coexist clearly in one identity a lot of times. Ah. Uh, but because you belong to both these identities does it sometimes mm. happen 
that your disability is not understood by the queer community and vice versa that your queerness is not understood yeah. by the disabled community yeah. definitely um i send this many times when there is you know um ableism within the queer community and then there is homophobia transphobia all is an impact in the disabled community right so um i i i'm like when i enter a room um i have a physical disability i walk with a crutch um but i'm also trans right um but i will all only be seen in terms of my physical disability um i will be seen as a disabled woman then i won't be seen as a trans person we're going again to um reach the, the standard of transness you have to change your appearance you have to transition you have to uh, in a way you know you don't look trans right that that and big label on our on our heads right uh so definitely when we talk about these two queer and disabled communities uh it's like a Venn diagram right there is on either side there is a uh, the queer community and then there's the disabled community and the queer disabled community is like a narrow um a, a narrow space in between both right this is what we're talking about we're talking about the narrow very space that everyone is scared about that everyone is tiptoes around right yeah. so uh uh so definitely um um many times i don't feel like i'm belong in either communities i feel like nobody understands my language of the same queerness um i wish there had been more um representation yes but more language more resources more accommodations uh more intentional inclusion during pride month during these pride events during these pride marches i often say i'm a i'm a queer who sits in a lot of your work you you seem to be you know a, a champion of a uh, disabled right and also an advocate for crip time that is taking rest and being objective about it for our audiences could you uh, shed some light on these two concepts uh, um so the beginning of rti was to a lot of frustration and uh, and rage um i personally had never um felt like i truly belong in my body i grew up the same way i have an acquired disability uh which wasn't there since birth but since i turned 9 years of age um uh i got a disability i had a i had a stroke so um especially at 9 years of age for someone for a child to turn from able bodied to disabled it was very confusing for me and from then on um i never felt like i truly found any uh, belonging within my new disabled body um no you know the language with which we articulate um the way in our in which our body functions the way we talk to our body that language um many times abandons us when we are disabled because there is little to no reference point of how to be disabled in an able bodied world how to love your crippled fingers or how to express yourself as a disabled person um this is a generation and a world now of hypervisibility right um 
uh, I'm queer as well. I'm trans, um, non-binary, and disabled. And during Pride Month, for example, um, everybody, um, a lot of us are uh, visible, very visible on Instagram, right? Visibility means pride. We are proud of our identity, of our journeys. Um, visibility also entails a lot of movement in the true sense of the word, like pride marches or um, even dancing for Instagram reels, right? But I think through RDI, we are trying to create a different form of visibility um, in our own way, a different form of disabled resistance um, where we can resist from anywhere. We can resist from our beds, from our chairs. Um, I literally started RDI from my bed, right? I'm a chronically ill, fatigued individual. And um, talking about crib time, talking about rest, um, I'm still learning how to honor my rest, um, especially being an activist, um, being, trying to be very out there at, at different points of time, trying to be out there during interviews, during panels, um, during video shoots. Um, there's a lot of demand for, in a way, the world demands you to be proud of your identity. Uh, it doesn't make much space for the shame and the guilt that you feel. Um, and the grief, a lot of grief that you feel within your disabled body. Um, the, RDI, Revival Disability India, also, we also make space for positive emotions, yes, like pride and joy, but also we look at, um, you know, um, all those emotions that are, that are pushed aside, that are pushed under a rug, that are not spoken about when you're disabled, um, I see technology as a huge part of what RDI does. Can you help me understand how RDI uses technology to kind of dismantle or try to dismantle the uh, heteronormative and ableist norms that we are surrounded by? Yeah. So technology has always been a big part of RDI. Um, uh, when I started the collective, um, it was the most accessible to me to reach out to, um, different people, not only in Delhi, uh, where I was, but also in the, around the world, right? Um, uh, the internet has provided me a lot of community, as, a, as it has a lot of other folks with disabilities. Um, for example, we have a WhatsApp group where, um, which is, you know, um, full of collective joy and the principles of disability justice and interdependence. Um, our WhatsApp group also acts as a place where we rant, of course, we rant about ableism, we rant about the ableism we face. The homo homia we face. Um, it also acts as uh, a place, a very accessible problem solving place, where, for example, um, if someone is having a problem, a medical problem, um, instead of relying on a doctor who again is inaccessible, who again has to me, we have to make you know, an appointment or um 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 physically go to the clinic. The WhatsApp group also acts as a place where 
I love me, but I love you, no one's friends, what's up and all, if she was gonna give, um, advice on what worked out for them. So, if someone is going through a chronic migraine, you know, someone who else who has gone through a similar, um, condition can tell them what worked for them. Or if someone is having a meltdown and is autistic. We are all there for them, right? We hold space for them. Or whoever is available on the group. It's not the labor of a single individual. And I think this is in, in the true sense of the term something called interdependence. Um, uh, um, we've all been um, conditioned in a way to force ourselves to be independent, right? Um, a lot of us were told growing up, how are you going to survive in a disabled body? How are you going to survive when you can't even walk? Um, how are you going to survive when you have a disabled hand and doesn't walk? And in a sense, when a lot of us began to see community like this is possible. There are others out there who are, who are, who have similar life conditions and situations as us. And we don't have to be alone. When we saw that possibility, right? Community in, in a lot of sense is possibility. So tech in that sense has also helped us personally name that. Um, tech has helped us start entire online campaigns from our beds and from our chairs. Um, um, tech in a sense is a privilege and uh, tech means an internet, an internet connection, right? You have to have an internet connection. But also it means making activism accessible to many groups. Um, it allows us to tell stories, to spread stories, to um, for others to send in their stories about their disability, about um, them navigating and negotiating in the world with their unique identities. Talking about how there is a lot of narrative, um, again, an inspiration born narrative of how to overcome your disability, how to fix, um, or cure your disability, how to cure your illness. Um, but there isn't much narrative of how to live a disabled life, how to, um, participate in a disabled culture, um, how to, um, um, how to survive in a way. For me, um, my entire childhood, um, was survival in hospital beds. So in a way, I wasn't, you know, um, I wasn't surviving in a hospital bed. I was just existing. And that's how I've lived my entire childhood. When you talk about um um structures and concepts like healing, right? Um when you're a person with a chronic illness, when you have an illness which cannot be cured, or when you have a lifelong illness, a terminal illness, where does healing begin? And where does it end? Uh, does healing even have a destination? So all of these topics, right? All of these concepts, um, are very political in nature. The disabled body is political. Me right now, um, participating in this interview, um, putting my disabled voice, my speech, disability out there in the world 
for everyone to hear, right? For us conversing within this, within the four walls of this uh, window, right? This this act in itself is political. So a lot of narratives, um, whether about weirdness or about disability or about the intersection of weird disabled bodies. A lot of narratives, um, whether in media or in corporate, and you can see it the way they are framed. They are frustratingly framed around this pity porn kind of a thing. Right. Now, queer stories and disabled stories, they need to come out. They need to be read. They need to be written. But when people who, let's say, are not queer or disabled, right? When they want to cover these stories, um, when they want to uh, bring out these stories, um, what distinguishes a, a, a good coverage of a story from like a pity porn perspective? Um, like if you were to give like two pointers uh, on this, what would those be? So while you were uh, asking a question, I also um, have been, you know, thinking about this a lot in a way where um, we cover a lot of stories about grief, right? The grief of living in a, in a body where, where, with which you have no control over, right? Um, uh, and then I ask myself, okay, are we relying too much on, um, in a sense, you know, are we um, covering too many sad stories or, or um, are we not covering enough stories about joy or about, um, you know, uh, positive things. But in a way, there's a difference between pity porn uh, when when a when a um person who not disabled writes a story about other disabled people, and um when when um a person who is disabled writes a story um or reports um on their community, there is a difference, right? Because in the latter, we are reclaiming the grief from um. Uh, this able-bodied notion of pity porn. Um, we are rewriting grief in our own way, in our own terms, in our own uh, journey. Um, and this exact thing of in our own terms is what is uh, the main message that RDI sends out, right? So, um, when a Firstly, when a non-disabled reporter wants to report on disabled stories, this might be a strong opinion, but I don't think they should. <laughs> I I just don't think they should. I think instead they should give the opportunity to someone who's disabled to write about their own community. And um, while I also believe in uh, allies and, you know, um, um, desensitizing people who might not have resources to learn about, um, different identities. I also believe in the power of listening and affirming, um, and the power of, um, taking up space and giving up space when it's not your space. Right. Um, that is something I really believe in. So, um, uh, while I had this very rigid notion of, you know, because I call RDI a collective for and my queer disabled folks. Um, uh, while I still believe that, I also, ha um, believe in giving space and providing space to have those difficult conversations. 